Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to give everyone a couple more minutes to log in, although you know, I would say we have about a quarter of our registrants signed on already, and then we'll get going. And until then, you can see our opening slide and our faces. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's panel, Green Schoolyards During and After COVID-19. This is part of a series of webinars focusing on nature connection during the coronavirus pandemic. My name is Jamie Zaplatosh, and I'm the Green Schoolyards Director for Healthy Communities with the Children and Nature Network. And the Children and Nature Network is co-lead on the Cities Connecting Children to Nature initiative with the National League of Cities Institute for Youth, Education, and Families. For those of you joining us for the first time, Cities Connecting Children to Nature is an initiative where we support city governments in more equitably connecting children to nature through technical assistance, peer learning, and pass-through dollars. We've worked with 18 cities to date since 2014, to really focus on systemic change through policies, infrastructure, and programs with support from the JPB Foundation. And before we start, a few housekeeping notes. So you're all automatically muted unless you're presenting, but we encourage you to please um, put in your questions on the upper right-hand side using the question mark box um, on your screen. Our team will be selecting questions for the last 15 minutes worth of Q&A with the panelists. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be shared. So research has shown that green schoolyards can enhance mental health and well-being, academic performance, physical activity, and community cohesion. Green schoolyards are also an exceptional use of public space. They're places for children to play and learn during the school day and offer the community equitable access to green space out of school time. These are a few of the reasons why partners across the country from education to healthcare to landscape design are advocating for using public school land as green schoolyards. The past few months, however, have made things a few or a few things perfectly clear. While research has previously shown that children need nature to thrive, COVID-19 has made that reality hit home. We are seeing exactly how much children and adults need nature during times of high stress. COVID has also shed a brighter spotlight on the inequitable access to green spaces. With playgrounds closed across the country, many communities and communities, particularly communities of color, have no access to outdoor play space, let alone green space. And finally, recent protests aimed at combating systemic racism are making it perfectly clear that these inequities, inequities are no longer acceptable. It's not acceptable that children of color do not have equal access to the known and proven benefits of nature. Today we'll discuss how green schoolyards can play a role in helping us build back better, stronger, and more equitably after COVID. A review of green schoolyard programs across the country during COVID has helped us identify some additional best practices, lessons learned, particularly around design and shared use agreements. We are seeing that cities clearly articulated their shared use agreements have continued to both benefit from these public spaces, even during COVID. On the other hand, communities that do not have comprehensive shared use agreements or other policies in place continue to or have seen their green schoolyards closed. We've also seen that green schoolyards with diverse design features offer flexibility in community use without being affected by playground closures. Today, we are going to discuss some of the best practices with the intention of building back our communities more equitably by ensuring that green schoolyards are accessible to all and green spaces to all. So we have hopefully um, just uh, dropped a survey link in our chat. Um, yes, we have, thank you. <laughs> um, to get, gather a little bit of data from you all on where green schoolyard programs exist around the country. 
if you could click on that link if you are online to take that survey, we'd be grateful. A lot of what we don't know is ex exactly how many school districts and cities have green schoolyard type programs. Um, and you saw the definition earlier. And typically, you know, if we look for four out of eight of those design features and multiple schools across a district um, having those features to be to put you in the green schoolyards category. Thank you all for taking the survey. It's pretty short. And if you are on the phone, we will be sending this to you in a follow-up email so that you can send that along to. We appreciate it. All right, everyone. Now it's time to introduce our panelists. So our first panelist is Barbara Deitch. FASLA and CEO of the Landscape Architecture Foundation in Washington, D.C. Her diverse background in both private and not-for-profit sectors and prior experience regreening cities from Hong Kong to D.C. has been instrumental to help show how a landscape approach and, uh, can help create a healthier, more equitable, and sustainable world. Barbara has earned her B.S. in Commerce from the University of Virginia, Master's of Landscape Architecture from the University of Washington, and was awarded a Loeb Fellowship by the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Thanks, Barbara. Our second panelist is Harris Solomon. Harris is the Associate Director of the 10-Minute Walk Campaign at the Trust for Public Land. He works where, there with mayors and civic leaders, park experts, and other partners to help cities prioritize parks and green space as first-tier solutions to municipal challenges. He specializes in public affairs, campaign communications, in program strategy. Prior to joining the TPL, he taught in the City University System of New York, served as a speechwriter with the US EPA Region 2, and worked in the office of the former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg. And he lives in New York City, <laughs> which he will reference soon. And our final panelist is Melody Alcazar. Melody joined the City of Austin's Park and Rec Department in July 2018. As the new permanent full time coordinator of the City's Connecting Children to Nature Initiative, Austin. She has over a decade, decade of experience working to connect children and families to nature and serves as the In the Children and Nature Collaborative of Austin, the Texas Children and Nature Leadership Teams, and has her MS from Environmental Science and BS in Zoology from Auburn. I'm going to turn it over now to our panelists to kind of give you more of an overview of both their organizations and their connection to green schoolyards. You're still on mute, Barbara. All right. Thanks. <laughs> I think by now I have the hang of it. Um, but I'm honored to be here, honored and delighted to be here on behalf of the Landscape Architecture Foundation and looking forward to this discussion today as green school yards are a key component of the landscape framework. And that what we do at the Landscape Architecture Foundation is work to increase the influence and impact of landscape architects or designers of the land and everything that includes people, places, um, uh, to achieve our mission to support the protection, improvement, and enhancement of the environment. Uh, LAF does this by investing in research and scholarships and leadership for the discipline. Um, I know a lot of, we've shared research with the Children in Nature Network um, and have platforms to, to help show the value, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later, of green schoolyards. Um, but hopefully you've also worked with landscape architects throughout your uh, assessments and strategic planning, your community engagement processes, uh, programming and design development and performance evaluation of your projects. I also want to start, um, I'll introduce this conversation by certainly acknowledging that it is a turbulent, messy and anxious making uncertain time out there. That's an understatement. Um, and that with the climate change disruptions from pandemics or other physical events will be the new normal. And that these disruptions, disruptions further highlight inequity in our public health system, our public education system, our public realm, which green schoolyards are a critical component of. 
And um, that's it. We as landscape architects want to work with all of you to change the systems and practices so we do have a healthy, resilient, equitable, and sustainable future on this planet. I feel like we're at this moment that keeps growing bigger and bigger and at a critical fork in the road. And so, um, again, appreciate this platform to learn more and share what we're doing. I also want to acknowledge from uh, landscape architecture perspective, um, the an LAF, uh, the oppressive and racist practices such as Jim Crow, redlining, zoning, and urban renewal, and the struggle for civil rights and human rights that is fought in our public spaces every day, and perhaps never more visibly than what we're seeing with all the protests that Jamie mentioned and ongoing police brutality, and asking the country to recognize that yes, Black Lives Matter. We are uh, in, the, in the majority of the planning and design professions that plan, design, and build the public realm, of which schoolyards are an important part, and are operating from a primarily privileged white profession. Um, and while we've been working on increasing our understanding of race, power, privilege, and oppression through our diversity, equity, and inclusion work over the last five years, it's a moment now and we're having a reckoning, which I hope with the lessons about inequity from the pandemic and the protests, uh, we will not go back to the way things were before from either uh, the way we do things and how we, how we do them. Um, uh, and so we uh, hope it will take us to a new and better future for all. And um, we have a lot of tools and resources for the things that we have been doing, both in terms of equity and uh, race, and as well as green schoolyards, and, and they need to overlap, and we're working on that. And so um, uh, we look forward to this panel to continue that conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. Clarence? Great, thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's an honor to be here today uh, with everyone. Um, I work for the Trust for Public Land, which many of you may be familiar with. We create parks uh, and protect land for people. We have since 1972. Uh, and one of the things we believe, uh, and that I'll talk about in a bit, is that everyone should have a park or public green space within a 10-minute walk of home. Uh, and we work on that in many ways. Uh, we've actually done a lot of on-the-ground work on green school yards. We have a long-standing program in New York City, as well as programs in Philadelphia, Oakland, and uh, other places. And we're currently working to scale that uh, nationally with a new initiative. Um, but I work on our 10-Minute Walk campaign, which was launched in 2017 to work with mayors, cities, and other partners to help actually make that vision a reality. So as... Uh, as you may know, we have uh, more than 300 mayors who have joined us across the country. And what we do is we ask cities to commit to what we call the 100% promise, which is a bold call to action for 100% park access by 2050, which is similar to the Green School Yards uh, action agenda, 100% by 2050. And we work with cities to help them actually meet that goal. So access, um, a 10 minute walk access is shorthand for a lot of things. So I uh, just want to establish that as many of the things that I think all of us are talking about and all of us are advocating for, particularly in light of COVID-19. So that is not only right close to home and easy to get to, but it also means that places need to be inclusive, they need to be accessible for all, and they need to deliver many of those positive benefits uh, that Jamie mentioned uh, earlier on the benefits wheel. So from the city policy angle, because we work with a lot of mayors and cities, Joint use agreements and green schoolyards are really one of the simplest ways for cities to make substantial progress towards universal park access. Um, and you may ask why, right? Many of you know the benefits, but why is it uh, such a uh, high value tool that cities have at their disposal? Um, there are a few reasons. One is that they increase access at a sweeping scale. So if you look at the chart on your screen, this is just a, a small number of cities that the Trust for Public Land analyzed last year, uh, looking at 10-minute um, walk access across the country and the impact that joint use agreements can have. And we found that there are huge double-digit increases in access in some cities. So if you look at Inglewood, California, for, for uh, example, you can go from 62.8% to 100%. And that, I want to point out, is in a city that 
does not necessarily have a lot of cash in its budget. It's a city where uh, more than 20% of people live below the poverty line. Uh, it is a city that is a majority black and community of color. And simply by drafting that agreement and ensuring the right factors are in place, we can expand uh, public access to green space, which as Jamie was saying earlier, we all know is, is vital during this time. The second reason is, is simply land use, right? Real estate is expensive. It's a very high cost, especially uh, in a lot of our densest uh, coastal, coastal cities. And there simply isn't the existing land and the existing capital to budget for new parks. Um, so this is a really easy way to help expand access uh, without investing uh, a ton of new resources and time into finding those spaces. And the third, um, which we'll talk about a little bit and certainly touches on equity uh, during the COVID crisis, is that we know that schools are community anchors. Um, whether or not you have children, schools are often uh, at the center of our neighborhoods. Events are held there. Many of us vote there. Uh, many people go to community engagement meetings and processes that are held in schools. So it makes sense to capitalize on that self sense of welcoming and belonging uh, by using schools to provide access to public space. Um, one of the things that I'll get into in a bit and that Jamie mentioned at the, the top of the webinar is that the quality of a joint use agreement and an understanding that exists between the city and its school district, depending on the structure, um, is, is really, really important, right? And informal and handshake agreements or even sweeping formal agreements don't necessarily guarantee equitable access. Um, and we're seeing a lot of challenges around that right now um, in light of COVID. And unfortunately, that is happening. Uh, that disparity is most stark in a lot of communities of color and, and black neighborhoods across the country. So I will stop there uh, and turn it over to Melody. We'll hear from Austin. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so Austin was one of the pilot cities selected to participate in the cities connecting children to nature. We'll call it CCCN for short cohort. Um, and working through a systems change framework, we are striving to equitably connect children to nature through um, four, actually five as of this week's uh, strategies. Green school parks, nature play, outdoor learning environments, which focuses on the zero to five group, youth leadership, um, and again, as of this week, nature smart libraries. Um, for the purposes of this conversation, I'll obviously be focusing on our green school park strategy. I think one of the reasons that we were able to take on this strategy is because the years of city school district awareness building that occurred um, over really the last decade helped create a culture around valuing green space. Austin is extremely fortunate uh, in that a majority of our campuses have large areas of green space and most schools have either accessible gates or open fence lines to allow for public access. In addition to that, we also have 22 joint use campuses, um, just like uh, Harris was, was talking about, um, which provide um, mainly benefits in the form of park maintenance, but it also opens up those sites to some park specific grant opportunities. Now, one of the first things that Austin did in joining CCCN um, was create what we've termed a nature equity map. And we examined uh, tree canopy, land cover, um, park access, and um, looked at how all of that um, played in to areas that we considered nature deficient. We then added in median household income and um, areas where children are abundant. And that identified areas where um, we saw that areas would have the greatest impact throughout our city. Now the initial efforts of the Green School Park strategy um, then used those highest impact areas and identified what schools had existing joint use agreements in place. And that's how we wound up selecting the pilot schools for the program. Uh, we currently have two green school parks created through our CCC and Austin efforts with a third underway. And we've actually been able to kind of continue our CCC and efforts even through everything that's been happening related to coronavirus because of where I am positioned within the city. Um, I've heard from a lot of our CCCN colleagues across the country um, that have been pulled to try and help manage everything that has come with this uh, pandemic. Um, as an FTE house in our park planning division, which really tends to focus on kind of master planning and land acquisition, among other things, our staff have been really fortunate to be able to continue these kind of bigger picture projects because they're actually deemed essential services. So providing that park space has become essential 
um, to uh, the community of Austin. Um, my position wasn't always um, hosted like this. Um, originally, it was uh, part-time and grant-funded, but by transitioning this job into a dedicated position, it has allowed this work of CCCM to be sustainable and even growing, even amongst the crisis that we're in right now. Thanks, Melody. And I'm actually going to, um, that we have a visual of the Nature Equity Index that Austin's team put together. And we also in the attendee chat dropped the link um, to how that Nature Equity Index was created in case that's something that you are um, interested in doing as well. So all the data sets, um, how they're lined up on top of each other and, and how that was all pulled together um, is all um, written up in that case study that we just linked. Thank you all for that introduction. And we're going to stop the slideshow and move over to the panel questions. Okay, so our first question that we've pre-prepared is, what are you hearing from your community or members of the of the, of the community on the importance of school grounds as community hubs right now, especially as it relates to school grounds. I think Harris, you're up for this one. Uh, sure. So uh, in my case, we we do work with community groups, but uh, we're we're especially hearing from cities, right? Considering the nature of my work, um, and I think one of the things that we are seeing in cities across the country, um, including cities, I might add, that have uh, very well thought out and intentional joint use agreements is that schoolyards are really vital community hubs and outdoor spaces, but that they're not being treated as such right now. Um, so if I even look right across the street, I overlook a schoolyard, uh, PS9 here in Brooklyn, and I see that um, luckily, right, the playground is separate from the schoolyard itself. So the playground is closed, but they've kept this general use yard open. Unfortunately, due to design, that's not the case in a lot of places. So if you stay in New York City uh, in central Brooklyn, right, which is a, an area that encompasses quite a few neighborhoods, um, majority low income, majority black and brown communities, there are simply not parks there. And one of the ways that people have access to public green space is through schoolyards, right, that have been com converted into community green spaces. Many of them have, you know, uh, small community gardens within them, right? They have nature play spaces and outdoor classrooms, um, but they're closed. They have been closed because the city has said these are technically playgrounds. They're within the schools, right? There's no division between the equipment, so we're just going to shut the gates. Um, and so we're seeing, it's exemplified in New York, but it's happening across the country, even in cities that have great joint use agreements, Schoolyards are there. We call them parks, right? We say that they function as public green spaces, but we've seen during COVID-19 that they're being treated differently and they're being shut. And during a time when we know that access to nature is vital, right? And as playing a key role in people's ability, both in terms of their physical health and their mental health, right? To um, persevere, right? Through this challenging time, people are being denied access to their local green spaces. Um, and that's one of the biggest challenges. Cities are, and I know you know this, Jamie, and your team, right? Cities are having real trouble figuring out what the boundaries are with schoolyards and playgrounds. You know, how do you keep people safe during this pandemic while still allowing them access to public space? Um, it's it's a serious a serious issue. And right now, as I said earlier, right, the the discrepancy in access is unfortunately falling on the shoulders of some of our most marginalized communities across the country, um, because many of them don't have, because of redlining and a lot of, you know, institutionalized racist practices do not have access to parks. Um, and so they're using schoolyards as uh, a way to get to that green space, but it's being to de denied to them due to policy decisions. So. Thanks, Harris. So our next question is that COVID-19 has uncovered many disparities, just like we talked about in communities of color. And what role do you think that green schoolyards play in addressing these disparities? So Harris got into this a little bit right now, or, or just now. Um, I just, Barbara, do you want to add anything? And, or Harris, do you want to add anything? Sure, I think, uh, Harris, you did a great job on this, uh, teeing up this question as well, um, covering the disparities and certainly to the most, um, yeah, uh, underserved um, 
and um, underrepresented, underrepresented, you know, environmental justice issues. That these are the most vulnerable communities too. That uh, which are predominantly serving students of color, um, uh, because not not only do they not only necessarily have, I mean, a, a public school is a way to provide access for everybody, and not all of them have the green school yard. So there's that issue, and then. In addition, the importance of those schools then serving as the public space in areas, just as Harris said, where they may not have, for various structural reasons, system, systemic reasons, have access to other open space. And also not only access to open space, but also um, uh, um, access, so to speak, or um, more exposure to air pollution, to waste, to other toxic environments. So how these the schoolyards are essential to make it more equitable and so to invest um, in not only having schoolyards open and accessible but um, uh, designing them right i look at a lot of the issues that harris brought up in terms of design issues okay so one is safety um, and security and um, but also culturally getting the place right a lot of communities cookie cutter schoolyards and playgrounds around the whole district when they're serving different um, different um, different needs and different um, cultural needs. And so one of the things that we're looking on, recognizing the trends that Harris brought up are, are looking at security design and safety, um, looking at community engagement, especially in this time of the pan physical distancing with the pandemic, what, what can we do? Uh, how do we have community meaningful community engagement? Is it possible? Uh, and we had a webinar on this so, a, a month or so ago. So uh, you can go to the LAF website and reference and you'll hear leaders in practice talk about different uh, actual methods for community engagement, but using technology and a variety of these methods in absence of being able to meet physically, which actually make it more inclusive and accessible to more people uh, through surveys, technology, um, videos, um, uh, different methods. So, so out of the pandemic, I think this is an exciting opportunity coming to help um, reduce the disparities um, that we see uh, for uh, schoolyards in these areas. I would just add one thing, if I can, Jamie, which is, um, I think, Barbara, you you spoke very eloquently to sort of a lot of the issues that we're seeing brought up here. The other one I would add is, just simply put, across the U.S., we've seen, uh, you know, the stark reality, right, of who has mobility and who doesn't during the pandemic. So that both refers to who has a car at their disposal. We know from, you know, the National Equity Atlas that I, uh, I believe it's in total when you look at black communities and communities of color, more than 20% don't have access to a car, right? And so when you take away something that's within a 10 minute walk, that maybe your only access to green space, that's right. gone. Whereas in a city like I, I uh, you know, I'll call them out, right? Charlotte, uh, which said, you know, we're going to close parking lots, right? Which they is partially an equity thing, right? So you have to walk to parks. But when the majority of your city doesn't have access to parks within a 10 minute walk home, that brings up the other issues. So we see who's been able to leave the city, right? Who's been able to go other places and who is staying at home in their community, right? Who is doing the ascent, the work that's been deemed essential across the country. Um, we know that all of these issues, as we're seeing, right, um, from the cultural moment that we're in as well, right, all of these issues intersect. Um, and I think it's just that much more crucial, right, that we address some of these disparities when we talk about green school yards, because they're obviously uh, so interwoven with some of the um, other challenges that we're facing within our, our cities and within our country. Right, and I'll just add that, um, yeah, also looking at the design of the schoolyards, a lot of them, you know, depending on the places where you may or may not have a lot of space, but they can be um, really over-programmed with things, and um, uh, and therefore the whole schoolyard gets uh, locked off or closed off, and so really also looking at opportunities to um, create unprogrammed, unstructured, open space areas. So in cases, uh, not only for when we're not in a pandemic, but in times of physical distancing that we can then 
serve the community for the health and recreation needs, even if they're more passive, they're very important. Thank you both. And Monica and our staff added in a link to the Landscape Architecture Foundation webinar that Barbara was addressing um, into the attendee chat. So if you're interested, I, I actually thought it was one of the best um, COVID um, webinars that I attended. I really, it was really um, thought provoking and visionary. Our next question is, in what ways does the pandemic bring us into sharper focus the inequities of schoolyard features that children face by school in regard to race and equity? I think, Melody, you were up for answering this, and I'm going to ask the other speakers to mute yourselves. Thank you. So, I, Jamie, I think you phrased this really well at the beginning. Um, we have campuses across our city that have evolved all on their own to become what we would kind of qualify and consider a green school park. So they already have gardens and bees, ponds, nature trails, um, and they're using those features on a daily basis, or at least they were when they were at school. Um, so the work that we are trying to do here in Austin is really just playing catch up to those schools. And in addition to creating kind of new green school parks, we also hope to ultimately bring those existing schools under our green school park umbrella to further support them. So just to give a little kind of context to this, um, about a year ago, we actually completely changed our approach to our green school park strategy. Um, with our pilot schools, um, we went kind of school by school and just did this large scale campus overhaul where we installed a hundred trees and green stormwater infrastructure and wildflower meadows and kind of you name it, it went in all at once. Um, but what we found is that so much more is needed in order for that campus to actually incorporate those nature-based learning um, into the culture of that school and that surrounding community um, that is using that site. So we took a step back from kind of choosing the next school and instead created a tool to assess the existing HO features um, that are found on our joint use sites to have a better idea on what is actually needed at these campuses, whether that's infrastructure or professional development or activation. And the tool itself looks at the presence, quality, and use of all possible eco features. Um, there's also a space to capture some conversation with the principal on how the school and also the surrounding community are either using it currently or hope to use it in the future. Um, so we wrapped up these assessments just about a month ago, um, which is where your question was coming from. Um, and we have found that um, areas that have the highest quality greatest quantity and most use of those green spaces were located in wealthier, predominantly white areas of town. Um, now, it's not that those parks or schools are necessarily be providing um, more resources from the school district or the city, but the parents at those schools and the surrounding community members are spending both their time and their money at those sites. So our next step is to get back in touch with the schools that we did those assessments at and walk through how we can try and help them reach their own green schoolyard goals. I think Barbara spoke to this um, really well, how people use that space in, in very different ways. And we don't want to prescribe what that site should look like and what it should um, entail. Thanks, Melody. Yeah, so if you've heard me talk about or, or if you've been in, if you're in a city that I've worked with um, in the past. Um, I really think it's important for every city and school district and partnership around green schoolyards to really define what a green schoolyard is to them. You know, that it's not, um, you have to have every single one of these features. Um, and, and so your survey question that you saw was you know, uh, directed towards, you know, do you have four or more of these features um, in m multiple schoolyards in your city? Um, that's one thing, but there's also then the use and how the support Supports, um, what, what support structures there are, what cultural practices there are around using those features. Um, because it, you can have a green schoolyard that's protected by a shared use agreement um, that isn't still being actively used by the school community. And we see that happen all the time. Um, and so there's, there's lots of layers there. This is also why um, when we support um, cities developing new green schoolyard programs, we really look to do equity-based district-wide green schoolyard programs, because there are so many cities around the country where um, parents um, or, or schools that have more social capital are really able to do a lot of the green schoolyard features and programming, um, and even 
you know, put together concept designs, um, do the fundraising around what that schoolyard conversion looks like. But it's just it's not equitable and it's not happening, you know, in, in equitably across most cities. And so really focusing on district wide equity based programs is where we're coming from from the Children in Nature Network. So our next question is, how does access to green schoolyards support efforts in your organization? You all wanted to answer this, so I'm going to let whoever wants to go first, go first. I guess I'll, uh, I'll start. Um, uh, mine is probably a more sweeping answer, uh, considering the nature of both the Trust for Public Land is a very large organization, um, as well as the 10-minute walk campaign, right, which um, brings on board all, a lot of different partner organizations, including Children's Nature Network and National League of Cities, National Recreation and Park Association, Urban Land Institute, to, to deliver on its goals. But overall, I would say um, green schoolyards really help support other efforts um, in a few key ways. Uh, one is simply right, unlocking access, is the way I like to put it, right? Um, when we work with cities, uh, whether it's a place where the Trust for Public Land has an office and a long history of local work, or it's a city um, that has come to us through the campaign that we want to work with, unlocking access through green schoolyards is one of the fastest ways, especially, Jamie, as you said, right, when it is universal across the school district or within city limits, um, and there aren't really a lot of stipulations put on when and where, that's one of the fastest ways to expand access. Um, the second way I think that it helps deliver on efforts uh, within my organization, and here I'm going to say the 10-minute walk campaign, right, is that it is very much about working across municipal silos within city government. And Melody, I know you know this very, very well, considering the nature of your work in Austin. But, you know, often when we talk about parks and green space, it's within the Department of Parks and Recreation, right? Um, and it is siloed there, and people say, oh, that's a parks thing, talk to my parks director. But we know that green schoolyards are one of the first sort of policy steps that a lot of cities take to think outside of that box. Um, and yes, it pulls in the school district, which may or may not be part of the city, but it also may pull in uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation, right? If you're talking about um, using permeable surfaces to help absorb stormwater, right, or high albedo pavement to reflect sunlight and keep things cool. Um, it may bring in a, your resilience officer, right, who works within the mayor's office or somewhere else, who's thinking quite largely across the city about how do we uh, sort of effectuate systems change that will make our city more resilient, and green schoolyards are a tool there. Um, so you see it actually seeding these conversations across city government and helping to sort of use the idea of access to green space, which is a wonderful universal goal, but using it to actually deliver on other city priorities, um, which is one of the sort of highest and best things that I think we can do uh, as professionals in this area and that the campaign strives to do uh, in working with mayors and city leaders. Thanks, Harris. I'll follow up on that and uh, a little bit further um, in terms of how LAF and our efforts uh, for our mission, um, the importance of green schoolyards is that it provides, I mean, it really provides that vehicle to influence values from an early age for being with nature, being with each other, that is fundamental to sustainability on this planet, and also a civic mindedness of, of being together. I often, um, before I made a career change to become a landscape architect, I uh, sold computers for IBM for 10 years, an <laughs> assistance engineer and a marketing rep. And um, I remember when uh, Apple got into all the schools, right? Because and, and that's how they got that whole market because they gave the, their computers early on to kids and then they grew up with that, that technology and that platform and then that's what they wanted later. So you really look um, at, introducing nature to kids is so critical, not just for their immediate mental health um, and physical health, but for an active and healthy lifestyle and an, an environmental ethic that will help, um, uh, yeah, continue to um, uh, on throughout their life. Uh, how are they, human beings, humans need 
we are human beings and we need to be outside and we need to be with other people. And so green schoolyards are an equitable way when done right to do that for everybody and have that experience. Not everyone can go go away to nature. You need it um, you know, where you are. And it doesn't have to be the Grand Canyon. It can be a street tree and grass and a playground. Um, uh, and that's where you connect with each other. And so just in, just it's so important to have that fundamental um, value and environmental ethic um, as part of their life that you get from green schoolyards. I can uh, dive in there from just kind of a practical perspective. Um, and I think Harris really set me up well for this. So thank you, Harris. Um, we, we really try and tie in our CCC and efforts to as many city goals as possible. Um, and one of the biggest reasons is that it's an unfunded citywide initiative. So while my position itself is protected, there's not dedicated funding tied to the many goals that we have created for ourselves. Um, and because of that, you know, we look we look for opportunity to try and kind of join forces with anyone that does have money. Um, and so we see this coming up primarily through kind of citywide initiatives where all of the departments are working collectively to achieve these kind of long-term goals, um, park specific, excuse me, specific uh, initiatives like the 10 minute walk, um, goals of other departments like our health department or watershed. Um, and then like Harris mentioned, of course, our partners, um, the biggest for us is going to be the school district. Um, and they have their own set of green school yard girls that we're also trying to kind of co-meet at the same time. Yeah, that's great, uh, Melody. I'm, you said that better than I certainly could have. Um, and I, I did want to add, I think all of us know this because we live and breathe it, but it's worth just mentioning is that um, one of the goals, right, that we all have is, right, making public space accessible to the public. Um, a huge part of that uh, is engaging with the communities where we're working, whether we live there or we're going in and working with the city um, or other municipal partners. And I think, uh, you know, many of us know, I just looking at the presenters here in our respective work, that uh, community engagement is a huge piece of the Green School Yards process whether that's establishing joint use in the parameters or it's actually designing the schoolyard itself. Um, I'll give a shout out to, I think, uh, Tiffany Briery from our New York Playgrounds team is on. And, um, you know, they do wonderful participatory design workshops with students uh, in the schools that are getting uh, playgrounds and where they're doing green schoolyards. Uh, that's true. And I know it's been integrated, Jamie, in your work into curriculum across the country. Um, so it's really a deeper way of uh, engaging the community, not only in, you know, the sort of uh, grand hall meeting that you have where city officials come and listen, right, but actually integrating it into uh, the day-to-day -day life of community members, whether that's students or it's parents or it's uh, the wider neighborhood, right, that's potentially going to be using the space and watching it develop. Yes. So I, I know that there's been a comment added to the chat, but if you do, as an audience member, have a question for any of the panelists or the panelists in collective, um, please do add that in. Um, we have um, time carved out to address um, those questions. And um, Monica on our team has been kind of looking at the survey results. And I know that, you know, we have a specific section of the population that's attending this webinar today. So it's not necessarily um, uh, relevant or um, not relevant, um, applicable across the country because we do have a targeted audience. Um, but out of 39 responses, 69% um, of the participants today are saying that they are in a city or a community that has um, multiple schools with four or more of those green schoolyard features. And 60% of them are actually saying that, that that parts of their schoolyards are open right now, which is really great. You're all very lucky um, that that's the, the case in your community. So um, our last question um, that we have is, before we jump into um, the audience questions, is how does access access to green schoolyards support other efforts in your organization? And, and we've touched pieces of that already, um, but I think you all have answers to this one as well. We just asked that question. <laughs> this is what happens when you're doing too many things at once. Sorry about that. <laughs> all right. I think I can add on to that if, 
in my time to another question we had planned, Jamie, no worries. Uh, Just in terms of a key focus of LAF is uh, research, right? Research leads to innovation and uh, 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 policy making. And um, so a key part of our component is research, which I know it is for the Children in Nature Network. And you can see how important that is. And we have a whole platform called the Landscape Performance Series, which shows um, uh, the, uh, it's a whole series of online tools and resources to help show the value of sustainable approaches, landscape approaches versus conventional, traditional, engineered, uh, you know, not landscape approach to um, all different types of work, green schoolyards being a key one. And we have a whole collection with starring Jamie from the Children in Nature Network uh, with case studies with quantified environmental, social, and economic benefits and um, peer-reviewed published literature that talks about, uh, uh, you know, the value from the social sciences, the natural sciences uh, for, for kids and, and all the things that I'm um, so impressed with what Austin's doing. And I certainly love the 10-minute walk and trust for public land. And, and um, so kind of bring it all together as, as a way of saying, look, we all need to advocate in whatever role we have uh, by being able to show the value of green school yards. And um, so these are tools and resources that would um, help you make the case, uh, kind of your kid apart um, to do that. So that's a key uh, part of our organization and, and why green school yards are important, again, is because it's a key part of a landscape framework. I, I feel sorry for new cities that just don't have a, a, a strategic civic, you know, landscape framework. And so schools are a way to help um, enhance that and uh, appreciate all the work that is being done. There's, I, there I, are even, do we, um, oh, you got, you got. I was just <laughs> going to, um, you, you, yeah, Barbara had started talking about research. Um, and so it made me think of the, the research that we've been doing at our green school parks as well. Um, assessing the effects of those green features on the health and climate of those students that use those sites. Um, And I think that 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 is a really important connection in, um, again, looking at how can we make connections with all of the other um, priorities within the city, whether that's through health or through Office of Sustainability and the climate plan that they're focusing on and just any touch points that you can make. um, It's amazing how far green school parks can actually go into all of those different strategies. Right. Um, and you, you can find funding sometimes tied to that um, because it's so related. That's a great point. And yeah, whether it's test scores or crime or safety or just uh, sense of the community, the tightness of the community, there's so many benefits, as you all know. And anyway, they're, they're packaged quantified benefits that show performance. Mm-hmm. Um, these are actually looking at built built projects and how they're performing over time. So um, we hope that helps you with your advocacy, your grant writing, um, making the case to the community, to the mayor, and so on. Thanks. Okay, we have a lot more questions and comments coming in now. Um, So one of our um, first questions is, in the coming school year, how do you imagine school gardens functioning with staggered school days, social distancing, budget cuts, et cetera? question comes from Karen, and I can definitely give a little answer to that too, but opening it up to the panelists first. I'd be happy to dive in um, just because we're managing that actively right now. So um, right when all of the the COVID stuff hit, um, our school district actually um, developed some access guidelines for specifically food gardens to try and make sure that that ongoing maintenance wasn't dropped off. Um, And we were able to make the case that food gardens were considered essential. And so that's how we were able to still kind of keep those going. Um, I would imagine, now I'm not with the school district, so I don't make those decisions, um, but I would imagine that they would adopt and kind of carry that on um, through the coming school year um, as it relates specifically to those gardens. Does anyone want to add anything before I go? No. Okay. Um, So Green Schoolyards America is doing um, some great work pulling together partners that are California based, but it's um, certainly a national coalition. Um, Coalitions may be a strong word because it's a really quick um, six to eight week um, movement making of really so getting um, supporting 
school districts to think about how to use the outdoor space that supports um, physical distancing, um, can really accommodate a lot of a lot more children to really ensure that that kids are able to go back to school and get an equitably good um, education. Um, and that's probably a weird word choice, but. One of the things that um, the research is saying around school districts is that 60% of kids, even if they got those laptops provided to them, they didn't turn them on. They did not turn them on um, in many school districts. And online learning just in general has not been serving our children. And, and I know, uh, you know, everyone was doing what they could um, and with the limited resources that they had and the limited amount of time that they had um, this spring. But we do have time before going back to school in the fall. And I know some schools start in August as well. So we're only a couple minutes or a couple of months away. But really to think about the outdoor space as being able to provide um, public, um, be able to provide education space and truly think of that as an extension of the classroom. And I, I have seen um, a stunning, and I hope we don't implement them, um, picture of a desk with plexiglass around it. And that's not what we want to see either, right? I mean, that's just that that's perpetuating all sorts of things um, and feelings, especially with the political climate right now, it's not the right way to go. And so how do we support what we know is mental health needs, um, as well as making sure kids have social social interaction, all of that um, by using the outdoor space um, when they go back to school. So I, I think that's really, um, really important. Okay, so there's a, a question that Harris uh, wants to talk about. Um, do you want to read it um, that, that you saw pop up? Because there, there's, a, there's a feed over here, but I, I'm happy to have you take it. Oh, sure, sure. I, I just thought it was an interesting question. It touched on a lot of, when we were talking about the disparities um, in low-income communities and communities of color. Um, someone said, redlining has come up a few times within the talk. Could any of you speak more on how that practice has and continues to particularly impact green space access? Um, and I do want to highlight it because I think, uh, particularly now, right, it's being thrown around a lot as like this, uh, you know, huge, um, uh, sort of vehicle that's been used, right, to reinforce systemic racism, um, and that even uh, f over five years, right, later, uh, it still has these um, huge impacts, right, on on how people uh, live and their quality of life. But specifically on green space, and I think it impacts green school yards as well. Um, when you see sort of like the need, the uh, need and desire for it within certain communities. Um, there have been studies that have shown that low income communities and communities of color or black and brown neighborhoods um, face disproportionate risk, right, from um, climate related threats, right? So they are hotter, they have fewer street trees. In many cases, uh, redlined communities may have had, right, because they were built in historically dense areas, right, they may have had parks. In many cases, those parks have been sold off. They have been repurposed for other municipal uh, needs. They have been disinvested over time. And so we see generally that just these communities, not just parks, are, are less green. They don't have the shade, right? They don't have all of this cooling infrastructure, um, I think it's often called, that exists uh, within wealthier, whiter neighborhoods. And so I just going back to what can green schoolyards do, right? It is real. I know this having worked under uh, Mayor Bloomberg in New York City, right? Planting a million trees is one of our goals. And that was a really big undertaking. Um, and that is to say nothing of investing in uh, existing parks that have been disinvested, creating new ones, etc. But we know that green schoolyards, as, as I said earlier, and I think everybody spoke to, are um, uh, a lighter lift, right? We can make those happen more easily. And I think that when you talk about addressing historic redlining that's happened in cities, uh, although it's obviously not one one to one, it doesn't have to do with you know uh, racist and discriminatory banking practices. It, it is a way to help address some of the dis those disparities in you know cooling infrastructure, in trees, in green spaces for kids to play, um, and that's why I, I immediately think of uh, schoolyards as a as a tool to help um, address some of those issues. So we probably only have time for one, qu one more question. Um, 
So we have a question from Laura that asks, and I think this ties well into our calls for action um, it momentarily that we'll be closing with. How can nonprofits that work with green schoolyards best work with city leadership to promote and elevate this work? I feel like all of you are able to answer this. <laughs> I, I can jump in. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, so depending on the existing kind of coalitions or collaborations that exist within your city, um, those are those tend to be the best kind of networking opportunities to try and figure out um, who has a need and how can we come and fill that need. So in Austin, we have several groups um, that, that kind of act in that way and, and the state of Texas as well. So there's TAEE, there's ISEA. It tends to be those kind of environmental education, informal ed folks um, that are kind of meeting, chatting, um, getting to know what each other are doing. Um, and that's that tends to be kind of the, your first in. And so if you have a group like that within your city, I definitely recommend hooking up with them. Um, cities often contract out certain programs. And so um, you have to, it's a big process in our city, at least. I don't know how it is in others, um, but you have to become a vendor and get on the vendor list. And it can be a little arduous to become one of those like few providers for the city um, but once you're in, you're kind of in and you don't have to worry about jumping through those hoops all of the time every year. Um, but you need to find that kind of point person that can help walk you through that system because it is very overwhelming if you have never done it before. So if I can just sort of give a plug for the work I do and the work Jamie, that you guys do through CCCN, um, you know, there there are national efforts, right, like 10 Minute Walk, like Cities Connecting Children to Nature, um, that come in uh, and want to help with not only, right, uh, financial resources in many cases, grants, um, but also, I think uh, you see a lot of professional development resources that exist around green school yards and parks and green space generally. I know NRPA, who we work with, has a lot of that. Um, you see a lot of willingness to help, I think, facilitate those conversations. I think a large part of what we do uh, on the 10 Minute Walk campaign is actually seeding those conversations, right, between city leadership, uh, people within agencies, community groups on the ground. So I think um, sometimes it may be a question of looking outside of your city, right, and thinking about what is going on at the national level that I can tie into, um, whether it's this larger movement around green schoolyards, Jamie, that, that you and Children in Nature Network work on, or um, whether there are other national nonprofit organizations that are doing some of this broader work around um, access to green space and parks, or perhaps around health benefits and education that you can tie into and connect the work that you're doing on the ground um, into sort of this bigger movement, right, that's happening across the country. I think we've seen a lot of progress in many cities and towns of, of varying sizes, right? Not just the biggest cities in the country, thanks to a lot of these um, efforts that are happening. And I just want to give a shout out, right? The JPB Foundation um, is a big funder uh, for CCCN and for the 10 Minute Walk campaign um, and for others. And they have continually um, made grants that help support this type of work and raise up that uh, community level work that's happening so that there's a connection between city government and community based organizations. Barbara, would you like to add anything? You do not have to. Okay. So I'm actually going to um, show you a couple more slides as we close out today. So um, luckily, um, we were wonderfully tipped off by Laura to, to start into this conversation. And you've been hearing this information threaded throughout um, today's, um, today's panel. Um, so on uh, our website, and I know we're dropping in links, and you'll get these again as a follow-up as well, um, we have a Green School Yards Action Agenda that was written and has been endorsed by over 120 organizations and individuals so far that really supports this vision um, that by 2050, all communities will have access to green school yards, similar to the 100% promise from TPL with park access. And I will say that we came up with those frameworks separately. So it's really nice that they support each other and they're synergistic and it's synergy and what we need. And, and so anyway, um, 
you can sign on to this action agenda, download it and take a look at it. See if your agency, your school district, your city is willing to sign on. We have all of those types of agencies um, already signing on. We actually have quite a bit of school districts um, and that aren't even all listed um, that have signed on um, to that action agenda. And we're really excited about what it's really going to make or it's going to take to make that happen. So that's one thing you can do. We also have an advocacy toolkit that we've created through focus groups like with people like you who want to know what to do and need the tools to be able to do it. So there's downloadable resources, slide decks, infographics, research, tools, all sorts of things that you can use um, to advocate for green schoolyards in your community. We heard um, Harris talk about um, the 10-minute walk promise, and I know that the um, link was already put in the chat too, and we'll again send it as a follow-up that their, um, it, uh, TPL did a, a great article last year that really outlined the case for green schoolyards and, and why, um, why joint use agreements are so important. And in that, there's a lot of um, research or there's a lot of links in there for you to look at what your park score is. You can figure out if your mayor signed on to the 10 minute walk. Um, there's a, a great, great amount of information in that um, if you scroll towards the bottom of the article. And lastly, as Barbara mentioned, there is a, a whole landscape performance series if that's the kind of information your decision makers need to really make the case for green schoolyards um, that LAF has put together. Um, again, research-based, um, all sorts of assessments on economic and social and environmental impacts that have been pulled together on individual schools, but also research um, that don't all overlap with what's in our research library. So thank you, um, Harris, Melody, Barbara, for joining us today, and all of you that have signed on. Um, and I appreciate all of the positive comments in the, in the attendee chat. I know it is a... Um, this is a, green school yards are potentially a major infrastructure shift that can change the way all of us live every day. And it, it's really exciting um, to think about what that opportunity is of just reprogramming and, and adding multiple benefits to existing public space can be. Thank you again to the JPB Foundation for their support of Cities Connecting Children to Nature. And we will, as I said, um, send you a follow-up email, which will have the webinar recording, all of the resources that we've linked and referenced um, in this uh, or during the webinar. And then we also have a survey that's been linked in to, to just a three minute or a three question survey for you to take about the webinar and give us any feedback. So thank you, the three of you for joining us today. And thanks all of you for, for joining us on the, on the line today. Take care everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks. Bye.